the host of the Larry Elder Show, and now a California gubernatorial candidate, Larry Elder. Welcome to the program. Glenn, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. I mean, Larry, I have to tell you, when I first saw, I just said this to Stu on, on air about 10 minutes ago, when I first saw that you were running, I was like, that's not going to work out well. Uh, because, I mean, you, you could be Ronald Reagan, but you're in California. And then I start to see the poll numbers, and you're ahead, almost double ahead of anybody else. Uh, you're out, you're out uh, raising funds uh, for anybody else who is in the race. And uh, you have a legitimate shot here. And that would be game-changing for not only California, but for all of America. You know, Glenn, I, I think it will be game-changing for uh, all of America for a number of reasons. You know, this critical race theory, this uh, reparation stuff, this tra- stuff you were just now talking about, training uh, white, white kids to believe they're oppressors, training black kids to believe that they're victims. People in the center are sick of this. People in the center are sick of people like this guy, Ibrahim Ibram Kendi, running around saying, just being a good person, just being a not racist is not good enough. You have to make sure that other people are not racist. This is the kind of stuff that's sickening people in the center. And so even people who are not Republicans are going to be, I think, buoyed by this candidacy. And about Ronald Reagan, a number of people, Glenn, have said, well, Elder, what is your experience? I said, what is the experience of the guy I'm running against? Gavin Newsom. This guy was governor of, uh, mayor of San Francisco. He was lieutenant governor for eight years. He had all eight years to think about what he would do if and when he became uh, governor. And for two years, we've seen a rise in crime, rising homelessness, declining quality of public schools. And the draconian way this man shut down the state while violating the mandates with the very same professionals who drafted the mandates when he was sitting at that famous French laundry restaurant, not engaging in social distancing, not wearing a mask. Ronald Reagan came out of Hollywood. He didn't spend 27 years, as I have, uh, up and down the state broadcasting. I'm on every major market in California from Sacramento down to San Diego. I've been writing a syndicated column since April of 1998. It's carried in the largest newspaper in the Valley here in L.A. It's carried in the largest newspaper in Orange County. I've been talking about issues like crime and homelessness and the outrageous cost of living for years. Ronald Reagan came out of Hollywood. Now, he, of course, was a student of William F. Buckley, began reading National Review, and at one time he was a left-wing guy. I was never a left-wing guy. So you could make the argument that I'm even more prepared to do this than (laughs) Ronald Reagan. Well, I will will tell you this, Larry, that the uh, – Ronald Reagan – um, uh, started to write uh, radio um, uh, minutes, if you will, right, uh, right. just like Paul Harvey, and and that was explaining his philosophies, uh, and that I think that really helped sharpen him and also prepare the way. You've been doing it in a three-hour format every day. That's right. And I'm a native Californian, and Glenn, my dad came here in 1945, right after the war. Uh, he worked two full-time jobs cleaning toilets. Believe it or not, was able to save his nickels and dimes enough to uh, have a stay-at-home mom, my uh, stay-at-home wife, my mother, uh, and she stayed at home until the youngest of us was in middle school. And he saved up enough money to move uptown to uh, South Central L.A. We were the second black family in the neighborhood. Now, the house is still in the family, Glenn. I just looked up on Zillow. It is now worth six hundred thousand dollars no one with an eighth grade dropout education could follow my father's path to the middle class here in california if he or she worked three jobs let alone let alone two uh and that's because virtually every development project every housing project in california is stopped by the environmentalists who claim it's going to have an adverse environmental impact that's why there's a shortage of housing in california that's why for the first time in our nation's history, middle class people, I'm talking about people making between 50 and 100K, are leaving California because they cannot get that first house. There's a magazine called CEO Magazine. It's been around for 17 years. And for 17 consecutive years, out of all the states, California has been determined to be the worst state in which to do business based upon taxes, mm-hmm. based upon regulations, based upon the anti business attitude that this uh, legislature and these environmentalists uh, have foisted on, down the throats of the American people. I have a regular guest on my program. His name is Leo Haney, and he's a brilliant economist with UCLA, writes a lot about real estate. He says because of the rules and regulations that we've had now for the past 30, 40 years, the average price of a home in California is literally 50% more than it otherwise would be. And that's why people are leaving for the very first time. And I think I can do something about that. So what is the biggest, what is the biggest problem that you see the first thing that you would have to tackle in California? I think the first 
thing I have to tackle is homelessness. Uh, you go under a freeway overpass in L.A. Uh, and a lot of other cities here in California, homeless people on either side. Now, uh, I don't blame all of this on Gavin Newsom because it preceded him, but he hasn't done anything about it other than to, quote, build more housing, meaning more government people building housing at a far higher cost than the private sector would do without doing anything about the underlying reason why people are on the streets in the first place. Uh, and uh, Why are they on the streets in the first place? Well, maybe 10 percent of them, Glenn, we don't really know the percentage, are truly schizophrenic, meaning a yeah. danger to themselves or to others. They literally need to be physically picked up from the streets, removed for their own safety and for the safety of the rest of the homeless population. Some percentage And, and put where? There. And put where? Uh, put in, in, in mental institutions so they can get treated. Uh, and um, the another percentage of them, I, I don't know how many, I think it's relatively small, are people that just don't want to work. Uh, and if you just don't want to work, either you're going to go to jail as a vagrant or you're going to get a job. And the rest of them, probably the bulk of them, are people who have mental problems or who have drug problems. They, too, need to be treated. Now, what we've done in California – it's passed something called Proposition 47. I think the voters were duped into doing it, and the idea was that some people who are stealing are stealing in order to support their meth habit or their heroin habit. Mm-hmm. And so we passed a law that says if you steal under 950 bucks, you don't go to jail. You're not a felon. You've committed a misdemeanor. You get a ticket if you get caught. Well, what the the, the uh, sheriff of L.A. County tells me, his name is Alex Villanueva, one of the people that I interviewed before I got pulled off the radio because of my FCC requirement running for running for office. He said, we, they've taken away our stick. You, you have somebody on the street who's stealing in order to support the, the, the meth habit, and we can't say either you dry out in jail or you dry out in rehab, one or the other, because we cannot tell them they're going to go to jail because they're not going to go to jail. And you've seen all these videos of people literally stealing in front of people, uh, in front of uh, walking, front of walking, guards, out. walking not, out, not not running, walking right. out. Now, as far as the mental illness part, churches need to be involved in that. Government can't solve this. We have missions in Orange County, for example, where they're getting people off the street, trying to give them some spiritual uh, instruction, uh, and that's what needs to happen. Now, I'm not at all saying that 100 percent of people on the on the streets can somehow become computer software programmers at Apple. I don't believe that whatsoever, but you cannot allow people to stay on the streets. It is a taking of public property. It jeopardizes the health and safety of everybody. They literally need to be removed from the street, and housing needs to be built for low-cost low cost cost housing, low-cost apartments. But we have no low-cost housing, no, no low-cost apartments because of the environmental regulations I just now mentioned. So the private sector needs to be unleashed to build these kinds of things. The religious sector needs to needs to deal with these problems. People need to be picked up off the street, and we need to then put them in, in these housing that's affordable housing built by the private sector, not by the public sector. The other problem with just building housing, which is what Gavin Newsom and the Democrats want to do, is you haven't dealt with the underlying reason people are there in the first place. Mm-hmm. A, B, you can't get them to get up in the in, in, in these new houses anyway. They're not going to stay. Uh, and C, you're inviting other people uh, from cold weather climates to come to California where they're going to be treated uh, with care and compassion as we should treat every human being. We're going to get free needles and free food, and, we're, and I might even be able to get a free house. So officers tell me, Glenn, a whole bunch of people who are who are living in these tents, who are in skin row, aren't even from California. We've incentivized people from the other states to come here. So for all those reasons, Gavin Newsom is doing what nothing whatsoever. He's not involving the churches. One of my mentors is a guy named Pastor Jack Hibbs, and he said, Larry, let us do it. Let us adopt a block, adopt a street, adopt an, uh, an area. Let us get these people off. Let us get these people the kind of instruction that they need while the private sector is building low-cost housing. And I believe that if I do the combination of things I just now mentioned, I can eliminate this problem. So, Larry, one of the things that I think we all learned from Donald Trump was the the system is so incredibly corrupt that there are career people that are just not, they don't care who the president is. Uh, And they will work to thwart and destroy everything the people elect somebody and put them in. They'll work to destroy that person. Um, how are you going to deal with a with a Californian uh, system of of progressivism, socialism that is just bred now into the system? It's a massive, massive problem, Glenn, I, and I'm not deluding myself about that. We have super majorities in the lower chamber of government called the Assembly, super majorities of Democrats in the upper chamber called the Senate. Uh, and talk about a deep state. 
particularly we have we have term limits. And I know a lot of Republicans like term limits. What it does is just strengthen the staffers and strengthen the special interest group. Yeah. The politician comes in, knows that he or she is gonna, only going to be there for a few years, and is given a lot more power to the so-called special interest. What I intend to do, uh, if I'm lucky enough to become governor, is to use a number of powers I have, even when dealing with the hostile legislature, not least of which is the ability to declare a statewide emergency. I'm going to declare one uh, regarding homelessness to suspend the, 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 the law that's called CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, that essentially allows anybody to stop anything for an indefinite period of time. Somehow, some way, Glenn, uh, the legislature is able to waive a CEQA for example, the construction of the Seattle uh, Sacramento King Stadium for a billionaire. Wow. They waived it for that, uh, but they can't waive it to, to build low-cost housing to, so that these homeless people, to the extent that we can get some of them self-sufficient, can get off the ground and, and go to these homeless places. Also, in education, I'm a product of the public education system. I went to Crenshaw High School. That was a school that was featured in the movie Boys in the Hood. Two percent of kids at Crenshaw High School can do math at at, uh, at state levels of proficiency. That's not a typo. Two percent. Seventy-five percent of all black boys in California cannot read at state levels of proficiency, and those levels are low. Did so you, did you say how? What was that percentage? Seventy-five percent. Oh my gosh. Fifty percent of third graders, Glenn, cannot read at state levels of proficiency. Now check this out. We have. 300,000 public school teachers in California. Every expert I tell I talk to tells me at minimum 5% of them are incompetent. That's 15,000 teachers. Any given year, you know how many are fired? 2 Point two are fired. Now, imagine if we did the same thing with the LAPD. There are 10,000 officers. Imagine if we had 5% officers who were bad, who were corrupt, planning evidence, uh, using excessive force, engaging in racial profiling. We wouldn't put up with it. But we're putting up with 15,000 bad teachers. How about I clear, declare a statewide emergency uh, on, on education, uh, and I get rid of minimum of the 5,000 teachers who are incompetent. Teacher, teachers get tenure in California after just two years, oh and it gosh. takes almost an act of God to get them fired. This is outrageous. 80% of the public school t- kids in California are black and brown. These are the ones that the left claims that they care about. Gavin Newsom shut down the schools. Again, the kids were already behind while his own kids were enjoying in-school private education. It is outrageous, and the teachers who know the schools the best, the ones with school-age kids, they're not putting their own kids in, in public school. Philadelphia, 44% of the teachers with school-age kids have their own kids in private school, as opposed to 10% nationwide, 6% of black families nationwide, 39% Chicago public school teachers, school-age kids, their own kids in private school. Here at the L.A. district, the public school teachers who have school-age kids are twice as likely to put their own kids in private school compared to families that don't have public school teachers. Holy it's, cow. The, it's the equivalent, Glenn, of opening up a restaurant, putting up a sign and saying, come on in, just don't eat the food. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nobody that works here eats here ever.